Hi everybody, in this video we're going to get an introduction to Git and GitHub. We're going to learn the basics of Git and then we're going to learn how to collaborate on GitHub. So let's get started. First, before we just jump right into learning the basics of Git, let's understand what is Git. So Git is a distributed version control system. It's a system that will record changes of our files over time, and it will help us be able to recall specific versions. And also many people can collaborate on a project while having their own version locally. So why do we use version control? Git is a version control system, and there's other version control systems out there if you choose to learn those. Um, for example, there's TFS, Kiln, Mercurial, Subversion, lots of different version controls. The reason that we use version control is one, it helps us with collaboration. So imagine that you're working on a project with a bunch of people and you're in some sort of shared file system with a set of files. Instead of the old school shouting that you're working on a file um, to your teammates who are in the office and then you know, you're telling them, don't touch this file. Well, guess what? Now you can work in that file at the same time that someone else is working with that file. And people can work freely with any file at any time and version control systems then allow you to merge all those changes into a common version. And then there is no question about what is the latest version because that is the file that is committed to that central location where your version control system is. But there are other benefits to using a version control system even if you weren't on a team. And that is versioning. So for example, you are making a website. If you make a website and let's say you make it in the theme of being all this beautiful blue, like this background here, and the client comes to you and says, I don't like blue, I want it to be red. Well, you still have your blue version saved and then you make the red version. And they go, I don't really like red, how about we go with yellow? Which is a very hard color to see, but we'll go here, they make a yellow. They see it and they go, you know what? I don't like it, bring it back to blue. Well, guess what? You have all those versions there, which leads you to the next bullet point here, which is restoring previous versions. You have stored these versions and instead of just copying a folder and saving it manually, this has been slowly kept track of. And if you need to, you can then restore that version. So that helps you with versioning and also restoring previous versions if the time comes. Another benefit to this, which is understanding the history of a project. As you are working on big teams and you have large projects, the projects make changes over time. As you slowly commit into Git, you leave little messages to explain what your commit is. You can at a glance, see the history, see why certain changes were made. Maybe if you're using a system like Jira, which is a issue tracking system, you would maybe say that you are updating to fix a certain bug with that ticket number next to it. Well, guess what? Now there's a ticket number. They can go into the system called Jira, look up the bug and see what the history is of that bug. And last but not least is backups, which is really, really important. So backups just for some reason the server that is storing your git repo dies okay which is horrifying if it does happen well you and your teammates all have a version of that git repo on your machines and it holds all the changes that are done locally on your machine so all those backups are available through you so you haven't actually lost history. So now that we have reviewed what Git is and why we should be using version control, let's learn how Git works. You can get Git for any platform on git-sem.com and then they have the downloads here. So they have Mac OS, Windows, and Linux. So Git comes with a built-in GUI tool and there, and there are also several third-party tools for the GUI, but we're not going to learn with the GUI, okay? We're going to learn with using Git Bash 
And then after you learn the basics of Git Bash, then you are free to use whatever GUI interface you want, or if you want to continue get using Git Bash, you can at fine. But it's super important to understand what you are doing and understanding the basics of Git by doing the commands. And then you can move on to using the GUI. I'm being completely honest here is in my everyday life, I use a GUI interface, but there are times when you have to go in and use the Git Bash, and it's very important to already be familiar with it. So download your version of the Git, install it, and now we will get started using Git. So once you've downloaded and installed Git, we're going to learn how to work with a local repository, or as later on, I'm gonna be calling it a repo. So what is a repo? Basically at the heart of Git, it's a repository or repo for short. And a repo is a container for the project that you want to track with Git. So you can have multiple repos for your project on your computer. So for instance, here, I have a new folder called Git Demo, and this is where we're gonna make our initial local repo. But if I back out into my dev subfolder, I have all the repositories that I keep track of. I have a lot of Git projects. You can have multiple repos on your computer and they're all tracked individually. And Git tracks the changes of the contents for that repo. So in the case back here, Git is tracking the changes for each one of these individual repositories and they're all separate checks. So we're gonna make a new repository and it's called Git Demo. We can right click and we're gonna say Git Bash here. And this is going to open up the Git Bash command in the location that we're at. So this is just like a shortcut to get Git Bash to be here. You could also just run Git Bash and then navigate to this file structure. Git bash is a command line environment where you can type in commands to control Git. So let's learn our first Git command. Our first Git command is git init. And this initializes our repository in the current folder that we're in. A hidden folder, which is going to be called .git, is gonna be created. So if I hit enter, it's initializing an empty Git repository. So yeah, actually you can see here, if you have your hidden folders turned on, there is the .git folder created right here. This is the folder where Git stores everything. So this is gonna hold our change sets, our branches, and it's all done locally. So if you end up deleting this .git folder, you lose all the changes that weren't stored remotely. So in this case, because we are just doing a local Git repository, if you delete this .git folder, you lose all your changes. It'll just be the most recent and there'll be no history available. So basically in this world, you can delete history. So we're gonna make our first file to add to this repository. And what we're gonna make is a readme file. So we're gonna go right click new, and this will be a text doc and we're gonna write read me. And we're just gonna keep it at TXT to keep this simple right now. So this is our read me file. And even though the file exists, it isn't being tracked by Git. We can see this in our Git bash by writing Git status. And this is gonna give us back the status of our repo. So in this case, we have no commits and there is one file here that is not being tracked and that's readme.txt. So it's not being tracked. Let's fix this. Let's make sure that git adds this readme. What we're going to do is type git add dot, which is gonna add all files to git. Doing git add is also known as staging. So we just staged our readme file in order to commit. But what does that actually mean? Let's see this. We're gonna type in get status and you will see that we are on our initial commit and we have one file that has been added. This file has been added to our get tracking, but it hasn't been committed yet. So let's see what that means. And what we're going to do is open up our readme file here. So let's add a new line here and we're gonna just 
start off with saying change number one. We're just doing the first change in our file and I have saved it. If we go back to our get bash and write get status, you will see that we have changes to be committed. This is our new file readme, but we also have changes that haven't been staged yet. We modified readme.txt with change number one. So in order to include change number one in our staged files, we need to do get add dot, which is gonna add all files. And if we do get status, you will see that we have no changes pending. So once all of our changes have been staged, we are ready to commit to our repo. So what we would end up typing in is get commit. And if we hit enter here, we end up in a very interesting Vim like screen and don't panic. I'm going to show you how to get out of this and then we're going to learn a shortcut so we don't have to ever deal with this Vim screen again. What we want to do is put in a commit message. So we are going to type in I shift I, and this means now we are in the insert mode and then we are going to type our commit. So in this case, I'm going to say adding change one. So once you have your text in here, you're going to hit the escape key and then we're going to type in colon W Q. W means right and then we are quitting. So this will rewrite the current file and exit and then it will cause git to finish the commit. So we hit enter and we have now committed one change and it's the git message is adding change number one. Let's verify that all of our changes have been made. So we're going to type in git status and I did a little typo. So I'll show you also how to get out, hit control C and that's going to exit us out. So we're going to type get status and you will see that there are, there is nothing to commit. The working tree is clean, which means that there has been no changes done to our repository. There are some of us folks who don't really like Vim. So let's make another change and commit it. And I will show you the shortcut so we don't have to end up in Vim. So I'm going to go to our readme and I'm going to add change number two. Going back here, if we type get status, you will see that we have modified the readme. So we want to commit this. And so we're going to add all our files and then we're going to do git commit dash M, which will allow us to use a, the, a way to write in our commit message right here. So we don't need to use the Vim screen. And if we have, uh, if we have a simple commit message, let's uh, add our commit message, which will be adding change number two. So now we have committed that to our branch. So we now have two commits in our repo. So we can view our history in our Git repo by doing git log. So git log. And you will see here that I have made a commit. The first commit was change number one. And then here is my second commit change number two. So let's add another file to our repository. So I'm going to make a new file here. It's a new text file and I'm going to call this cats.txt. So I added the cats file and I'm also going to make another change to our readme file here. So I'm going to make change number three and we're going to save. So if I go here and I type get status, you will see I have the modified file, which is our readme.txt because I added change number three and we have an untracked file, which is cats. So if we did get add dot, that's going to add all files, whether they are tracked or not tracked. If we only want to add a specific file, we can write get add, and then we can specify the file. So this will be readme.txt, which will just then stage the readme file. You can also use wildcards when you're doing your git commands. So you could say get add, and then say wildcard.txt, and this is going to add every single file that matches that txt. So in this case, now readme and cats have been staged. 
So if we do get status, we would see both of them have been staged. What if we don't want a file to ever be added to our repository? Well, the good news is we have something called get ignore. And you're saying, well, why would I not want something to be added to my repository? Well, there are things like DLLs or bins that get produced when you build your code that you don't need to track the changes for. There's also things like logging that are maybe more of local debugging tools that you also wouldn't want to keep track of. So we're going to make a new file here. And I'm going to call this test.log. So now this has a different extension from our other ones. This is just dot log as the extension. I'm going to type in get status. So you can see here that I have an untracked file test.log, but I actually don't ever want my test log to be committed to my repository. So we can uh, tell Git to ignore these files by creating something called a git ignore. So you can create this file manually like I did with the dot log, or we can use our git bash to create the file for us. So the keyword that we're going to use here is touch. So we're going to say touch dot git ignore. If you are familiar with Linux, you know this command already. So when you do touch dot get ignore, this is going to create a file, uh, a get ignore file for you. You can now edit this file and you can add things that you want to ignore. In our case, we want to ignore the dot log files. So I'm going to open this notepad plus plus, and I'm going to tell it to ignore dot log files. So I could tell it to specifically ignore test.log, or I can tell it to ignore all files that end with the extension dot log using a wildcard. So we can do asterisk dot log and we can save this. Now, if we do get status, you do not see the test.log file showing up as an untracked file. That is because it's being ignored. Now, our get ignore is here, and we need to make sure that we add our get ignore to our repository. So let's now stage our get ignore and commit this change to our repository. So we're going to do get add all our files, and then we're going to say git commit dash m and we're going to say adding dot get ignore so now this has been committed to our repository so now you understand the basics you know how to stage a file you also know how to ignore a file and not track it and you know how to commit to your repository let's now learn how to branch Branching allows you to work on a copy of the code on the main line without directly effect or affecting the master branch or main branch. Normally what you would do is that you would work on a branch to work on a specific feature or a specific bug and commit there without affecting the master branch. So you could be constantly working on something and maybe it could be non-working code and then slowly over time you make it work because it's your individual branch you're not affecting the master branch and actually out on the job force you would never commit directly to master you should always be working in a branch and then you would do something called a pull request which would then be merged into master and master is something you do not directly commit to so let's make a branch in git you make a branch by saying Get branch and the name of your branch. So in this case, let's name this branch dogs. So this is going to be get branch dogs. So the new branch has been created, but as you can see here, we are on our master branch. So how do we switch over to our dogs branch? We would do get checkout dogs. And now we have switched to the dogs branch. If you can see here, you're on dogs. So let's make some changes on our dogs branch. So we're going to make a new file. Let's make a new file and we will call this file dogs. And let's update our readme to have another change. So this will be change number four. And now let's stage this and commit it. So we're going to say git add 
all and then get commit dash m adding dogs so if we do get status we have nothing to change so we have done this on the dogs branch let's go back to master and see what master looks like so we're going to do git checkout master so you can see really quickly we have switched over to master and we have lost the dogs file and this has changed so let me reload it we've also lost change number four that's because those changes only exist on the dogs branch they do not exist on the master branch let's say that we are done with our dogs branch because we have successfully created the file dogs and we have successfully done our change number four so how do we get those changes into our master branch well we do this by doing a merge but before we merge we should also make sure that our destination branch is up to date so if we write get status you will see that our master branch is up to date so there's nothing to commit tree is clean we are good we can move forward with our merge so we want to merge dogs into master so we write get merge dogs so this is going to take the branch dogs and move it into master so this has been merged into master our dog file now exists and if we also have our readme file has been updated so it gets reloaded and change number four is there so this went rather smoothly but what if it didn't because i'm working by myself so of course my merges work perfectly fine there's only me going on what if there's multiple people what if you make a change to read me and someone else makes a change to read me and now these changes conflict so we're going to learn how to deal with something called a merge conflict so let's make a change to master we're going to add change number five and we're going to commit this we're going to stage this and commit this so we're going to see a little shortcut here of how you can stage and commit in one line we would do get commit dash a which is going to commit all tracked files it's going to stage all tracked files and then we'll have our message dash m which will be adding change number five so the readme file has now been committed to our master branch if we say git status you see that it is clean let's switch over to our dogs branch so get checkout dogs so we have switched to the dogs branch if you can see that our readme has been updated it only has change number four in it that's because now master is ahead of dogs but you do not know this yet so you're going to make another change let's call this change number six and let's commit these changes to our branch so we're going to do git commit dash a dash m adding change number six. So this file has now been committed to our dogs branch. So let's switch back to our master branch and try to merge dog into master. Git checkout master. And we want to merge dog in, dogs into master. So let's do that command again. So get merge dogs. And you can see here, we have a conflict in our readme file. So we can, it's not going to just merge it perfectly. We need to tell get what to do. The automatic merge has failed. So we need to fix these conflicts and then try to, uh, to then commit the result. So if we go here, our readme file has changed. It is showing us what is in our head and what is on the branch dogs. This is where the conflict exists. Now, in a more complicated project, this is a little bit harder to read on where the merge conflicts are. And there are tools to do merge conflicts with. You can use tools like WinMerge, which is very old, but I, you can still use it. 
and you can also use some other built-in tools as well. So right here, we can do this one by hand. So we want to fix this. So let's, we know that our changes should be uh, change five, which apparently I misspelled, but we're gonna move on, and then change six. And now we can commit those changes. So we could write git commit dash a dash m merging logs into master. Do our get status and we are good. We are clean. So now you pretty much know the basics for git. Um, so let's now learn how to work with remote repositories. The important thing to remember here is despite working with a remote repository, everything is actually by being done locally. So all your information for your Git repo, all that code is going to be living right here in this Git folder. There's all your logs, your information, the configurations that are being done. And the only difference is now that you are going to manually retrieve items from your remote repository using something called pool. And then once you finish committing your code, you are going to push your changes to your remote repository. So we are going to make a remote repository on GitHub, but your remote repository can be on any other cloud service that's out there like Bitbucket or GitLabs. Those are all other viable solutions. You don't technically have to use GitHub in order to have a remote repository. So let's make a repo on GitHub. So this is my GitHub profile and we're going to make a repository on GitHub. So you would one, create a GitHub account and then you can start using GitHub to host your repositories. And as you can see here, I have a lot of repositories. Some have been forked, some have been created by myself. And uh, over time, this is just an area that you can hold your information on. And as you can see, some of them are private which means that I don't share them with other people, except for you guys right now, when you get to see what it's named. This is just a way for you to store your repositories in the cloud. We're using some cloud computing here to help us out. So we are going to make a new repository so we can say new, and then we can name our repository. In this case, I'm just gonna call it get demo because that's what we're doing right now and you can choose to make it public or private. Now, if you choose to make your repository private, there are limitations to the private repo, uh, unless you're paying for GitHub. So keep that in mind with what you choose to do. In this case, I'm gonna have it public because by the end of this tutorial, I'm going to delete the repository. So you can also add a uh, description. So this is git demo. Uh, for YouTube. And you can initialize a readme. Now, when you use GitHub, the readme that's gonna get initialized is using a language called Markdown. You can also initialize a git ignore. The nice thing about the git ignores is that you can specify the type of code. So if you were using Java, for instance, it's gonna say to ignore certain things under the bins that get produced by Java. If you said that it was C++, it would end up ignoring some of the .o files. So the these are just a preset git ignores. You can always add more to it, but it's nice if you have a starting point that you know that your project's going to be at. We're not gonna have a git ignore for this one. And we're gonna create our repository. We have created a new repository called git demo, and it is on our GitHub. So how do we get this code? Well, we need to clone our code. So you can choose to clone your code, and if you want to, you can set up SSH, or you can just use HTTPS. So I have SSH set up, so that's why it always shows here, but we're going for this tutorial just to use the HTTPS. So now we want to clone our repository. So we are inside my local get demo. So we are inside our local get demo repository. So we want to move out and have a separate repository because we can have multiple repositories on our machine. So let's go back cd dot. dot. 
So now we're back into our dev folder and we can do now the git command to clone our repo. Git clone and our URL. And in this case, I have a folder named git demo already. So it's gonna cause a little problem. So we're gonna specify the folder name. So it's gonna be git demo two. So now we are cloning git demo. And if we go back to our dev, there is get demo two, which is now pointing to our remote repository. So if you wanted to look at this, let's go into our get demo two. And we can see that we have master checked out and we can look at our remote repository. So here, this is gonna show all of our remote repository. So you can see that we have it pointing to our origin repository. So if we wanted to see our URLs, we can type get remote dash V. And this is showing that origin is pointing to my GitHub, Kog Cho Jam, get demo dot git. And that's where the fetch is coming from and where it's also pushing to. Origin is the default alias for the repos that we use and so that we don't have to keep typing in the URL. So we can now use something like get push origin. So now we can start working and doing the exact same changes that we have been doing before, except we're going to be using additional steps, which is fetch and pull and then pushing to our code. So let's illustrate this on our get repo on GitHub. So I'm going to make a change here in our readme that says change on line. And I'm going to update this readme and commit this change. So this change is being committed on GitHub. My local repository does not have this change. So if we go down here and write get status, it still is clean. And if we look at our readme, we will see that it does not show change online. So we need to get these changes from our remote repository. Get fetch origin. This will get the changes that were made from the last time you either cloned or fetched from origin but it will not merge them for you. You can do, so if you look here, no changes have been made. It hasn't been merged for us. We would do, we would do get pool origin. And now this pulls down the code. And if you see here, there was a change made. So we refresh, we got the change from online. So we've seen how we can pull down results. How do we push things up to our repo? So let's make a change here. So we're gonna do change locally. And let's commit this code. So we're gonna do git commit dash a dash m. I'm gonna say local commit. So we have now committed this code to our local repository. We need to now push it to origin. So we're going to do get push origin. And this is going to push the code to our origin. And in this case, I'm not logged into GitHub. So I have to make sure that I log in to my GitHub account. So after pushing these changes, you will see them on your Git repo. So here we are change locally. So there's many other tools that you can use also in GitHub. You can see here, there's ways to fork, which means that if you find a repository on GitHub that's public that you like and you want to use it as a base, you could fork it. I have many forked repositories like Alexa skills that you might have saw there that I've been working on that I based off of like the Alexa skills that were given. You can also make new branches. You can do this within your code and commit the branches. You can also make a new branch here. Um, you can also do pull requests. So as it says here, pull requests help you collaborate on code with other people. So when you create a pull request, they will show up here and you can make a pull request. So 
let's make a pull request. So let's go back to our get demo here. And we're going to just do this all online for the purposes of this tutorial. We're going to make a new branch. So we're going to create a branch called cats. And this is based off of our master branch. We have some things here. I am actually kind of annoyed by the styling of our get demo file. So this is our readme file. So I want to fix it up. So this is a get demo for YouTube. It doesn't break out. So we need to do double line breaks. So it's change lonely. And then we'll write here. I like cats and dogs. And we're going to update our readme. So we're going to make this change. So we're committing this change to our cats branch. And now what we want to do is make a pull request. So we're going to go to our pull request stop tab. So we're going to make a new pull request. And what we are going to do is we have our base, which is our master, and we want to do a pull request for cats. And so what is going to happen is it's going to compare these two changes to each other. So if you can see here, um, there has been some changes done, right? We added a line break and um, the changes within Git is detecting that this line was deleted. Although it wasn't deleted, we had another line break in between and we added the new line, I like cats and dogs. Now, so as you can tell, it's all, not always 100% correct. So you do need to read your changes and see if it does make sense. So when you get a pull request from someone else, don't just blankantly think everything is good. Um, or think that everything is wrong. If you read this and you went, oh my God, I can't believe they deleted change locally. Well, they didn't, it's, it's right there. So pay attention to those changes. So we're going to create this pull request. We want to now title our pull request. So in this case, update readme. Yeah, I am doing that. So I am updating the readme and I am saying fixing readme styles and adding new content. So this is telling what I have done. Now, when you make pull requests or changes, you should make your branches feature specific and be smaller changes because you don't want to be that person that's making 42 different file changes. You want them to be small, tiny changes. And no one wants to review the pull request that has 42 file changes. So think small, tiny things. This is also useful because if something went wrong, it's a small thing that gets rolled back, not an entire giant thing. You learn this more over time. So this is a concept that maybe doesn't really sit too well or make sense right now as a more junior developer, but as you work more and become more experienced, this is a, a concept that makes more sense. And you learn how to make things more feature specific and not just do big, huge, colossal changes and pushing the code forward. So we're going to create this pull request. So now the pull request shows up and on GitHub, it checks to make sure whether or not there are conflicts with the branch. Since there are no conflicts, you can just merge in this pull request. Um, people can come in and review. You can make rules that things can't get merged in until they're reviewed. I'm the owner of my own branch. So I come in, I make a pull request. I can merge pull requests or deny them however I want because it's my branch. But you can see that here's the pull request. It's updating the readme. There's a conversation. So if you want to ask questions and say, hey, this thing doesn't quite make sense, you can start writing it out or maybe just asking questions. Remember, asking questions is not insulting. This is collaborating. Asking questions isn't a critique. It is just trying to understand where you're coming from. Then you can see the commits that are associated with the pull requests. At the end of it, you can choose to merge your pull request. You can merge in the pull request with all the commits here. They will go straight into the master branch. Some people like this because then you can easily um, see every single commit that was made. There's also a squash and merge. What this does is it takes all the commits that are under this tab and squash them into one commit. And then that gets merged into master. At my jobs, people have done either way. And honestly speaking, you just go with what the team likes. 
At the end, you can either comment, you can merge in the pull request, or you could close the pull request if you don't feel that it is something that you want in your code. So in this case, we're gonna merge the pull request. So there was no conflict, it looks good. You could even leave a comment, looks good to me. So we're commenting, and then we're gonna merge in the pull request. So I'm going to merge in this pull request. This is what it's going to look like on the commit. I'm gonna confirm the merge. And this pull request has been successfully merged into master and therefore it has been closed. And if I want to, I can delete the branch. And this is a good idea. When you are done with a feature and your code has been merged into master, you can delete that branch and you should delete that branch because the next thing that you're working on should be a different branch. So let's delete our branch. If something comes along and someone goes, oh my God, that was the worst thing ever. We should have never put that in. Well, revert right there. You can revert your commit. So if we go back to our get demo or on master, you can see the formatting has been updated. I like cats and dogs has been added. So now you know how to also collaborate on GitHub. Congratulations, you have learned now the basics of Git and you also have learned how to start collaborating on GitHub. Guess what? You don't need to use Git Bash. If you're not comfortable, now is the time that you can download a third-party tool to do those GUIs. You can do um, Git Kraken or Source Tree, whatever you like. There's other ones out there. Those are the two ones that I know really well. And um, happy coding.